All right. Welcome to the Many Shades of Green with my co-host. Am I the host and you're the guest or your co-host? Me? That Maxine. It's my show, the Many Shades oh, of Green. What are that, you talking about? That's Maxine's show. I'm a... <laughs> Just, just, just you're, observe just it. you're just presenting things. I'm know. presenting things. Excuse me. No, you're co-hosting. Co I, I look good. If you see the show, I look good in a tuxedo with a, a glass of champagne, which is also about 40 years ago. Wow. So I, I, I keep. I, I want to preserve that image in my mind. Sure. <laughs> anyway, well, welcome well, to the show. Introduce our guest, yeah. Maxine. Yeah. Well, you know it. it the, the crazy opening just brings about the crazy times. You know, it's been quite a it's been quite a ride in uh, good old U.S. of A. right now. With uh, we have a president elect Biden and and VP, you know, glass ceiling shattering uh, Kamala Harris, which is amazing. Except we have a toddler in the White House who um, thinks everything's a fraud. Except we know the only fraud is the toddler in the White House. So aside from that. <laughs> Aside from that topic, we have an incredible guest who I've known for a while, and uh, she likes to get dirty, which is the name of her uh, podcast, Getting Dirty. She has a podcast as well, and uh, she is Allison Turkan. Um, she's a farmer, and she manages right the the dig farm. Is that what's the title? What's your title at the dig farm? I like to call myself founder and farmer. Founder because I home. started the whole thing and now we're working the whole thing. Okay. Can we so call she, you Madam uh, Farmer? You can call me whatever you want. <laughs> Just don't call me late for dinner. That's, That's it. That's right. <laughs> she, she has really great brunches, you know, and, and dinners. And I guess not as much because of COVID, unfortunately. But that'll be again. But it's yes. outdoor events, so it's a little easier uh, but you also work with the community and you educate children and you work with farm aid. So I want to kind of get into all of that and, and, and you can tell us, you know, how, how you came about doing all this. Um, but first, just quickly, uh, and you Malcolm too, uh, do you eat chili peppers? Me? Yes. I eat chili peppers. So do, uh, do I. you eat chili peppers? Good. Well, that. That's good. It's good news that you eat it because, you know, I always throw in a little science silly fact in my show, in the show. <laughs> so, so, so I'm going to just read this off because it's a chili pepper fact. Consumption of chili peppers may reduce the relative risk of cardiovascular disease mortality by 26%. Wow. This is uh, according to an analysis of diet and mortality data from four large international studies. You know, we got to believe all that. Chili pepper consumption was associated with 25% reduction in death from any cause and 23% fewer cancer deaths compared to people who never or rarely consume a chili pepper. So when that group, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, boy, they all must be in good shape. Um, yeah. Except for the drugs. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the, the, these studies have to be more com confirmed, but you know, Spicing up your life is good, you know. Um, well, I might have a reason for the for the health benefits of it. Because when I have yeah. red hot chilies, I have my cerveza, beer. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of good things about chili. And, you know, because we, we need spicing up in our life, you know, aside from the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So I'm so glad we all eat chili. But anyway, let's, let's get back down to, down to the farm. So now, now to Allison and, and um, so, so basically what, what started you on the path to being the founding farmer of this, this, this farm in, in Northern Westchester in North Salem? Uh, how did this all happen? So I have been working at Starbucks actually for almost 20 years. And after 10 years at Starbucks, you get to take a, what they call a coffee break, but it's basically a sabbatical. And I decided at that point, I wanted to take my sabbatical and I did something crazy. And uh, I have what I, I had, what I call my eat, pray, love year. And uh, I went to France for a year and I worked on three different organic farms because I always had an interest in it. And uh, a friend said to me, you know, if you think you want to do it, you should try it out and make sure that you love it. 
So I went to France. I worked on these three farms. And not only did I love it, but um, I realized it's definitely what I wanted to do. But being over there and seeing the difference in the food system in France and the way people eat food and deal with food and respect food completely blew my mind and changed my world forever. So when I came back, not only did I want to be a farmer, but I had this urge and passion to be educating people to have kind of the same experiences that I had while I was over there and kind of learn the things and think about food because I realized that we don't really think about our food and what Mm -hmm. we eat and where it comes from and why it's so important to us. Wow. So so how... So that experience, the Eat, Pray, Love experience in, in France, which I would love to have an Eat, Pray, Love experience in France. <laughs> yeah. I mean, take me with you when this COVID thing's over. It's, Absolutely. My bucket list is, you know, going going to, to France. I've never, I've been to Europe, but I've not gotten to France. So will you go with me? Why does it differ? Allison, why does it differ? You said there's a difference between the French uh the way they eat their food or view it and the way americans do what what would you say is the basic difference i mean i see that a lot of the french culture a lot of european culture because i got to spend a time spend time in different countries as well but you know just the concept of going to the market on the weekends the big outdoor markets that they have and you you know the person who's giving you your bread. You know the guy who make who grows and raises your meat, your vegetables. You know this. You go to the same cheesemonger every week. So there's that direct connection. There's more of a value put on the things that you're eating. Um, I think the sourcing of like that local food is just really integral into the part of the culture so even in France you know you're never rushing a meal you're enjoying you're eating it's part of the whole experience um I think that even when you walk into a supermarket in France in Europe the amount of product that is in the supermarket is so significantly different because they have you know a lot of things that we have here are are not even available there because they're full of all kinds of things chemicals and, and, you know, processed things that are illegal over there. So we have a lot of junk stuff over here that they don't even have. So supermarkets are not quite as big and expansive and full of stuff. So you see it in the supermarkets, you see it when you go to the market and how people just eat and enjoy and relax. And, you know, I feel like they understand that food is not just an afterthought. It's actually a main thought and it should be something that we can, we should be thinking about with everything that we put in our mouth. That's wow, so, that's, that's yeah. awesome. It's no no glyphosates in uh, in Europe. I think they they did make those illegal. And the experience that I could bring personally is the, there's a lot of markets in Westchester, and you do know your farmer, and you do yep. know the bread you know people. I mean, in my area, everyone knows all the vendors, and 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 I know you know you you're involved you know with markets too. So that people can know, know you is, is pretty, pretty exciting. Um, ha, has the pandemic, how has it affected all of that? How has that affected your abilities to get to those markets or in general, how has it affected farming, small farmers? I think that um, the pandemic has really kind of been a double-edged sword in terms of agriculture and small farms. I think a lot of people really want to know their farmer right now, and Mm -hmm. they want to have those relationships. Obviously, in the beginning, it was a question of whether markets were going to even happen. Um, So a lot of the bigger markets and the more organized markets got together and they did a lot of, you know, everything was online. So now farmers had to adapt and be handy with websites and online Mm. markets and things like that um but you know they it was a pretty good it was a pretty good year because everybody wanted the local food and people were way more into it um i'm not a big commercial farmer so Mm. we're kind of an educational farm so markets isn't how i make or break it you know so i was lucky and it didn't affect me directly um it affected how we have classes and educate people and do things on the farm. Of course, we had to be, you know, putting in 
protocols of staying six feet apart, staying outside. Uh, we didn't really do some of the big groups that we normally do. But um, overall, it was great because a lot of people had no place to go. So they wanted to come and be out on the farm in a safe environment where they could be outside and be doing something worthwhile and learning something new in, in a safe place. So I think it was a good, it was good in that respect. Um, although, of course, it's challenging, but, you know, I think a lot of, and then as as it went on here in New York, we're pretty lucky that our numbers stayed low for a while. Yeah, they're um, starting to go up now. Yeah. They're starting to go up now. You know, I mean, they're going to go up everywhere. I think we all expected that to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it was it did allow a little bit more flexibility in the markets where people could go in, but they weren't touching produce, you know. Right. So it was just a shift on the fly type of a thing. But demand was definitely increased yeah, as well as, you know. One, one thing I want to follow up, Allison, you say the people come there to learn or like you, you give them education. Do they get down on their knees and do the farming with you or do you show them that? Or yeah. is it only Absolutely. Well, a lot of times um, we have a lot of volunteers that want to learn. So they, you know, they don't really have a lot of experience. So they want to come. They want to see how it's done. And again, we're not a big you know, I don't have tractors going through here, tilling up the land and doing that. It's basically just a huge version of what you could do at your home. So mm -hmm. they come, they learn. And in addition to that, our model here is that when you come and you work, you get to go home with fresh produce every uh -huh. single time you come. So, so why aren't I working there now? I mean, why are I, I work in the summer? Next hey, summer, I'm on. I know. I'm going to hold you to that, Maxine. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold you to that. Did yeah. you have places we for people to sleep? Get dirty. Did you have places for people to sleep over, or is it to just a day and then they go home? It's just for us here, it's just the day and then they go home. Um, we don't really have, you know, that, although that's not something that would be out of the question at some point. Um, but for the most part, you know, under normal circumstances, we have individual volunteers or friends, you know, parents with a kid that will come. Um, we also normally we do groups of different types like school groups or you know youth groups um corporate groups things like that where they would come and spend the day and do different things uh but again all of that was really limited this year yeah so i, know. I have one question how is lewis Lewis is excellent. He is hanging in, um, you know. What is Lewis? We have to tell everyone who Lewis is. Lewis is our pot belly pig. At How many farm. pounds is Lewis? Oh my gosh, uh, too many pounds. He's a little <laughs> chunky for his little piggy self, but um, you know, he's very gentle and he's great. And that's part of the whole experience of coming to the farm. You know, everybody gets to feed Lewis a carrot and scratch him and you know, see the chickens and we've adopted some turkeys now, which are kind of interesting and cool. So interesting. I haven't seen, I've seen the chickens and Lewis, but not the turkeys. Yes. Um, also, the turkeys are good. Kind of an, just a little backstory on, on the farm itself. Like you work with the Westchester land trust and with a particular person, cause I have to bring out Dick, you know, I just yeah. need to get him into this. H how did I, you, you work with Dick buttons. Yes. You know who Dick Buttons is. Not everyone knows who he is. And we, both Malcolm and I know, because uh, we're kind of old school dude and dudettes. But um, Dick, could you explain Dick Buttons and the connection to Dick Farm? I can definitely explain Dick Button. And I would tell you right now. I don't think right anybody now, can really explain Dick Buttons. But go ahead. <laughs> well, but I'm going to tell you right now that he would tell you, Maxine, that it's Button because you only want to have one of him. Right. Um, Dick you know, Button. I'm sorry. Yeah. Correct. No, that's, that's okay. That's, that's my faux pas. It's, a, right. it's, a common, it's a common thing that people say, and that's always his response. Right. So I have been extremely lucky and blessed to um, find myself on the land of former two-time Olympic gold medalist figure skater and sports commentator extraordinaire, uh, Mr. Dick Button. And so I came to this property, I've been here five years. And the first couple of years that I was here, I was with another farm that you know, Maxine Deep Roots Farm. Mm -hmm. um, Scott and Stormy were just yep. starting out their farm mm -hmm. and I was just starting out my nonprofit. So I came and we had a mutual friend and um, Scott had 
gotten onto this land by way of a connection through the Westchester Land Trust, a farm match program. So at one point, Dick Button had said, hey, I would love to have a farmer on my land. And the Land Trust connected him to different farmers, actually, Tiny Hearts Farm. Um, they were there for two seasons, and then they handed it over to Scott and Stormy of Deep Roots right. Farm. Um, and then from there, Scott and Stormy are big commercial organic farmers. So they moved up to 20 acres in Copake, New York, right. and that left this place to be taken over fully by Dig Farm. So we have just been growing into it, and I've had the opportunity to build an amazing relationship with, you know, Dick Button and um, he supports everything that we do and he thinks it's so great. So we're just honored to be um, kind of manning the land over here on his property. Is he staying in Fantastic. North Salem during the pandemic or is he, did he go? Or no, did he stay yeah. Stay? Yeah, why? He's, he's, he's been here on lockdown since March. Okay, that's what I thought. I'm just curious, uh, when I hear you speak about the, uh, you know, organic uh, farming or vet or, or growing, somehow I, you take me to Michelle Obama when she was trying to do that at the White House, taking the kids yes. through the different things. Have you ever got to meet her or to speak to her about what you're doing? No, but I would love to. She's such a, you know, I mean, I, I obviously at that point when she, when that was her whole mission, I was very excited because I thought that that was a great, um, you know, she was all about organic farming and teaching kids gardening and getting garden programs into schools. Uh, which of course is a great mission, but you know, our days are still going on, so you never know. Good, yeah. Maybe we'll send her a copy of the show, and, and she can uh, listen to it. <laughs> she has her it. own podcast now. Far yeah. Right, uh, and, and I think um, you know, uh, 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 Hillary Clinton has a. Everyone's like, hey, it's a podcast on every corner. <laughs> it's a podcast well, world. Well, well, th this is. is a Zoom kiss, and not many. They're not, I think. Uh, many Zoom casts right now probably will come out because I just started this uh, you know, during the pandemic and realized, oh my God, you know, yeah. I can see my, I can see myself. That's yeah. exactly right. I know. Because I've been involved with radio for the last 40 years and doing, you know, doing shows and uh, being a station manager. So this is relatively new for me to be on air. Wow. Yeah, I yeah. know. It's, it's but a what thing, do you I hope mean. to accomplish uh, with your educational things in organic farming? Um, that's a great question. I personally, you know, so our mission at Dig Farm is reconnecting communities to the natural good of the farm. So what we mean by that are, you know, reconnecting. So these are all skills and things that people knew at one time or people appreciated. So I really hope to encourage and allow as many people as possible to have experiences that make them think and have them open their eyes to think about where their food is coming from, how their food is grown, why it's important. So as many different, Maxine mentioned that we do the Sunday brunches mm -hmm. and that's for people who don't like to get dirty, but just like to eat good food. Um, yeah, and it's so good. They, <laughs> you know, so they I, can come and they I, can I, I volunteer. <laughs> you're in I have a seat ready for you um but some you know again some people want to learn and especially kids when you get kids mm -hmm. in there and you let them pull a carrot out of the ground or pull a tomato off the vine and eat it straight away teach them how to make pickles you know from cucumbers all of those things so just kind of doing my part to to spread light around the subject of food yeah, it, it, it reminds me of when, when I when I was selling radio. A, a lot of my, for some reason, a lot of my clients' is, clients were restaurants, and not the big restaurants, the chef-owned restaurants. And I had occasions to go shopping with them in the market or seeing them in the kitchen. And I never saw a group of people that enjoyed what they did. And, and literally, when they would go in the market and, and and touch the food and smell it, there was a delight in their face. Or, when they, or, or in the kitchen when they were chopping it up and, mm -hmm. and, and smelling what they did and throwing the sauce in there and tweaking it. It was, uh, I mean, they loved it. And, and you sound yep. the same way with, uh, you know, what you're doing. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I started out as a foodie and I love to cook myself. So just Mm -hmm. like that, what's better than cooking, you know, is cooking food that you grew. So it's pretty much a full circle thing. And that's part of the things that we teach too, is cooking food. Because sometimes, for example, you'll get a CSA share from a farm or you'll go to the farmer's market and you'll see produce that you don't know what to do with it or you've never experienced it before like a kohlrabi or something like that and we try to focus on doing things with random produce and show you how simple it is to be able to eat and enjoy that we teach things like canning and preserving and dehydrating and you know all of those old old school skills um, that help you to get the max out of what you're growing in your garden or what you would get at a farmer's market What is kohlrabi then? What is kohlrabi? So kohlrabi, it's kind of a cool, funky looking, uh, it's round, it's the size of a baseball, a softball. It's got little leaves growing out of it. Um, It's kind of a, it's in the brassica family. So it's it's in the family of like broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a solid ball cabbage. How do you, how do you, what do you make with, I mean, how, what does it use? It? How do you cook it? I mean, what do you? Um, you can eat it raw. You can make it like a, chop it up and make it like a French fry, you know, roast it up. You can roast it like you would any other roasted vegetable. Roasted yeah. Yep. You can make a slaw out of it, like a coleslaw type situation. I, I'm, I'm getting hungry. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, you, I think I pickled beets. I mean, a couple of summers ago, I got, oh my my word it they were just <laughs> well, I, well, I just, I, aside from aside from, i went through it now i'm getting hungry too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> getting, aside from us getting hungry and of course the food is healthier for us how does this help the uh, are you involved with the ecology as far as uh you know how you grow it and uh, replenish the earth and yes explain absolutely. us about that tell us about that okay Uh, So, you know, we have here in Westchester a very healthy organization called the Bionutrient Food Association, the BFA, and their whole mission is teaching people the value of building good soil. So it's regenerative agriculture, basically, is what it's called. And I like to think of it as it's a step beyond organic. So it's not only not putting pesticides or chemicals into your ground, but it's also building healthy soil. And um, it's, it's a little bit different than when normal people think about gardening, you know, you're not pulling plants out, you're not tilling every season, you're actually trying to just continually add things to the soil to make it better. You're adding co- lots of compost, you're adding um, obviously organic fertilizers, things like humates, you're always mulching your soil so you never have bare soil exposed to the wind or the elements. And um, we also, this season, did a whole remodel of our land and we redid it on contour of the slope of the land with raised uh, trenches. We did trenches and um, like raised beds, basically. So Mm. they're on a nice curve on the, they follow the flow of the land. So that's an effort to help maintenance water better. So the concept is you dig several deep trenches going down the line and you fill those with ideally something like stone, but you can do wood chips, which is what we did. And it helps to allow the water as it's flowing down in its natural course to sink deeper into the soil. So if you get a lot of rain, like we happen to be getting right now, Mm -hmm. it sinks it all down into the soil. It allows it to spread out and it just naturally maintenances water better on your land so if you think about something like machu picchu like the stepped right, terrace right. Step it's terrace similar there. like that now, wow. now, now how, how does like water pollution and chemical pollution how, how does that affect the soil how do you protect against that or they say the groundwater sometimes can be poisonous because you know it's been run off from uh, factories or and, and of course the air can be contaminated how do you deal absolutely. with that absolutely Um, Well, you know, particularly where we are right now, I'm very lucky we're on 48 acres that is surrounded by preserved land beyond that. So we're in a good spot in terms of not having to worry about, and we don't put any kind of chemicals, you know, on the grass or anything like that. It's a hard, 
it's that's a hard one because most people you know even if they're doing something natural in their garden in their backyard they could have a neighbor who's spraying roundup or weed killer or you know some kind of something you know an insecticide to get rid of ticks that's just full of chemicals um everything that you put on the ground goes into the ground goes sure. into the soil ultimately gets into the water so it's it's a constant battle that's part of the education process as well you know showing people that you don't have to do that and why you shouldn't do it and it's it's yeah. a challenge so are you constantly testing the grounds that you're you're planting in and uh, the water and it seems like this would be a never-ending battle uh, again, like I said, I feel like we're particularly lucky where we are because our, our ground, you know, the field that I grow food on prior to growing food on it was a cow pasture. And then, so nothing has been sprayed on it for a long time. Um, we do have water going through the land. So yes, that could theoretically be tested. Um, we use well water to water or to irrigate or pond water. So yes, you would be testing. It is an ongoing thing. You're, you're constantly testing the soil, but in terms of uh, pesticides and chemicals, for us in particular, I feel pretty confident that we're doing a good job. Yeah, they're in a, uh, the farm's in a beautiful area and, and I know everything is, is done there to keep the pesticides and everything away. And um, so, I mean, I, I, anything that I get there is absolutely delicious on every level. When you taste something that is picked out of the ground right before you, the taste doesn't exist the same. I mean, it's just your mouth goes, explodes and has a party, you know, so Absolutely. It, it, it's fantastic. Now, you also have worked with Farm Aid, which is Willie Nelson's you know, that, that big, I guess they didn't have it this year. Did they have a virtual one this year or did they? Didn't they have it? Yes, they did have a virtual one. And I was so upset that this would have been our fourth year able to attend that um, concert. Uh, yeah, so back in the 80s, Willie Nelson started Farm Aid with John Mellencamp and Neil Young. And then later on, my favorite Dave Matthews joined the board. And they have been fighting for small farmers, you know, ever since because... Mm when this is another thing that once you start looking into it and seeing what's really going on with our food system in this country, it just gets more and more disturbing. So it has been a systematic effort for huge corporations to be taking over our food system. So Farm Aid does a lot to help support small farmers from losing their land and helping them in any way that they can to stay on their land. Um, That's important. So, yeah and you have a store a quick story about any any experience you have there with any oh yeah are you, <laughs> are, you one, leading, are you leading me down like this road yeah i'm leading I, you I, down the road because you know rock and roll baby or country or whatever you i uh so of course you know it's willie nelson and um i i, I was a huge fan of Farm Aid and everything that they stood for. And I've been watching the concerts for years. And then through the opportunity of being part of the podcast that I get to do, uh, of course, a natural next step was to go to Farm Aid as media and be able to interview a whole bunch of people, farmers, as well as some of the musicians. So one of my additional favorites is Willie Nelson's son, Lucas Nelson. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you haven't heard of Lucas or Micah, who is Willie's other son, they are incredibly super talented. So we get to Farm Aid the first year and we check in and we're in the media tent and they have a whole sign up list of the people that you can sign up to interview. So I look down and there's Lucas Nelson's name and I'm all excited. So I put the... I write my name down and I say, okay, maybe we'll get this interview, who knows? So we're going around throughout the day and they're very super organized and I'm interviewing a girl from South Dakota and she's telling me about, you know, the Dakota Access Pipeline and mm. all of these important things. And I see behind me, I get the, the signal to wrap it up because we got the phone call, we gotta go. <laughs> so we wrapped up that interview really quick, we made it back up to the media tent and they escorted us backstage where Ooh. we got to walk onto Lucas Nelson's bus 
right after they had performed on stage. And awesome. as you can imagine, he's uh, Willie Nelson's son. So you can imagine it was kind yeah. of a little like Fast little, Times at Ridgemont little, High little going in there. The magic dragon. <laughs> it was a little bit. But uh, so I got to interview Lucas Nelson on my first trip to Farm Aid in the back of the bus. Well, so wow. that was exciting. Yeah. Now, now, yeah. as a, now as a product of the 70s my question is did you get a contact high uh, you know i i, it, I was so giddy that i don't even know if it was that <laughs> or if it was just probably a combination but, now, yeah question. can i being in los angeles can i avail yourself to your to your product can i avail myself to to your product do you do any mail order or can i order it or no, I really don't because, uh, you know, we're basically pretty local, like I said. So I'm not, um, everything that we do in terms of canning or making food or things like that stays right here. 99% uh, of it is given away to people who come to the farm or friends and, you know, people that visit, volunteers. So, no, I'm not really producing anything that I'm going to be selling to you in california but you're welcome to come and visit mm. and i'll feed you really well, <laughs> well uh, if you, you, come do, visit. You, you have the salads i'll, I'll bring the wine they, okay. uh, that's a deal that is a deal <laughs> that sounds like a plan you know <laughs> anyway guys it looks like it's the end of our half hour believe it or not oh man wow. i didn't even yeah. get my what's your shade of green today question so okay quickly, go for it well, well like, since since uh this is no time limit go for it <laughs> well, there is. <laughs> no. Shade of green. What's your shade of green today? We'll, we'll end with that. My shade of green today is olive egger green Ooh. because I am thankful for the eggs that my chickens produce for us here that we all get to share <coughs> and enjoy. So mm -hmm. olive egger green. Okay. I'm, um, I want breakfast. I'm coming over. <laughs> Okay, and I, don't know. My door is open. Away. <laughs> I don't know. And then you because also have a podcast distance. on a, 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 a radio, radio station. What, what is that? It's uh, HudsonRiverRadio.com. It's internet radio. And uh, we do a weekly podcast on Monday nights. It's broadcast live. And then you can access it anytime on HudsonRiverRadio.com or Spotify. And it's called Getting Dirty. Uh, okay, as I say, uh, Check it out. I'd be glad to run that on uh, MalcolmPresents.com. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Yeah, anyway, it's great meeting you. It's great meeting you, Maxine. It's good to meet you. Yes. Anyways, Thank you so much. I don't know whether we'll have a show Thanksgiving or not, but everybody out there, have a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, all right. Well, if I you think can. we got one uh, next week, but the week after, yeah. probably not. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Allison. Bye, guys. Thank we'll you so you much. Posted. Okay. Stay well, okay? Yes, you too. All, All right, right, guys. Bye-bye.